So here we are in our third class meeting, and I wanted to first mention the issue of office hours. The syllabus says uh, to be determined, and so I will have office hours that meet your needs. So one of the things is by appointment. Anytime anybody wants to make an appointment, by all means let me know and I can meet you because I have a very flexible schedule. Donna had an office hour meeting with me. It was horrible, right Donna? You'll never do it again? I loved it. Okay, all right, so it wasn't that bad. Um, what I'm thinking is, since class starts at 6.30, and I often need the last 30 minutes before class to you know, sort of arrange stuff, I'm thinking 5.30 to 6 on both days that we meet, okay? So if there's anybody who can't meet then, then we set up some other time. So I'll put that in the Canvas version of the syllabus, that's a regular office hour where you can just drop in to talk about anything, 5.30 to 6, Monday and Wednesday, and then also by appointment, okay? All right, um, up here I've got a couple of things this was in the New York Times a week ago today, and it relates to something that's going to be one of the last topics we cover in this course, and that is convergence, and media convergence. And when you think about what is a commercial newspaper, a commercial newspaper is something you buy the newspaper, and you get news and information and entertainment, and then you get a bunch of ads. So the ads in the newspaper are selling something. So here we have an ad for Starbucks. And what it's selling is the idea that if you come to Starbucks, you can have free online access to the New York Times. So mm. we've got the convergence of a newspaper is advertising a coffee house, which is advertising the newspaper. So we have a, a rather interesting sort of convergence, which goes beyond some of the normal sense of convergence. All right. Oh, and that reminds me. I have lots of links in the Canvas site to New York Times. I can subscribe to the New York Times. I put this in the video. If you suddenly, a link doesn't work for you because it's like more than the 10th time, let me know and we'll figure out how to get it to work. See, I've got a subscription, so I have unlimited access to links in the New York Times. Non-subscribers, after you've hit it certain times from the same computer, would say, hey, you gotta start paying. So there's a couple ways. One would be to go through the library, which has a subscription to the New York Times, or probably less inconvenient for you is, I just take the story and instead of just linking to it, I copy the content and paste it into Canvas and that way you can get it. So anybody, if you can't connect to a link that you want to know about, let me know and I'll connect that to you. All right? All right. Enough of that. All right. Here we have an ad that came in Saturday's New York Times. And we have a picture and one of the things we learned about last time was color. We have some nice warm colors. We have a very athletic looking woman. And it says, welcome to the best place to get in the best shape of your life, Peloton. Anybody know what it's advertising? Anybody want to take a guess what it's advertising? What's that? Yeah. No, it's not a sports bra. She's got on a sports bra. What's that? You're getting close. It's not exactly a gym. Does anybody recognize the word Peloton? So you people don't watch the... What's that? Biking. Yes. So basically, uh, when people are in, when they're in these long distance cycling, the peloton is sort of like, it's the ball of people that are all cycling together, etc. So it turns out peloton is a, a stationary bike that you could buy and have in your home. So there's the beginning. So this is an ad, and it's not just a full page ad. It is a two page ad. So now you get to see what the bike is, and then you get to see the child of the person on her bike, and you get to see the fact that she is biking in her home, and then on the back you have all this other information. And the whole idea is a lot of people go to these spin classes. Well now you can have the result of a spin class, including you can be connected to like a professional coach who's on the other end of a digital connection and is telling you to cycle faster, 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 etc. So it's an interesting ad uh, in many ways, but uh, one of the things is that it's basically eight full color pages, which I'm sure costs a dime or two. So we'll just pass it on so people can have a closer look at it. All right, so we've got um, office hours, we've got posters, new links, and news about visual communication. So, in the modules, there's a module called news. And so, 
the top half of it, the top two thirds is stuff from last fall, and now here's the new stuff. So we already went over the West Point grads, we went over uh, uh, Odor punching Batista. Websites won't take no. So then this one, and 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 this one are all about the controversy that started with this story, original Gizmodo story about Facebook anti-conservative bias. So Gizmodo says, guess what? Your trending stuff in Facebook is not just neutral, and it's not just based on the normal way that Facebook stuff is, where somehow it's figured out what you like and it's given you what you like. It's also throwing in news stories, but guess what? There are people at Facebook who are saying, oh, here's a nice liberal news story, that's going up there, here's a conservative news story, let's put that one in the round file. And so the claim was, uh, conservative news stories weren't making it into trending. Mm -hmm. So then, that led, this is a New York Times article, social media takes on new roles, the whole idea that Facebook is not just a thing, it's not just a place where people connect to each other, it's the primary way some people get their news. Once mm -hmm. upon a time, people got it from newspapers, then more people were getting it from TV. Well now, some people are getting most of their news from Facebook. And then, the next two, or, or actually Facebook moves to repair its fractured relationship, and the last one, Facebook and Right Make Nice in Meeting, are about the idea that uh, Zuckerberg and some other big mucky mucks at Facebook got together with some big mucky muck conservatives and said, no, that's not really what happened, we're not biased against it, etc. And in between then are a couple other stories, including how it actually works. And to me, it's all fascinating, but the idea is, Yes, there's an algorithm. There's this machine that figures out what you like and is giving you what you like. But then there are people who are saying, okay, well this one would normally be put up there by the machine, but I'm smarter than the robot, so I'm gonna move some stuff around. So it's quite possible that there was some inadvertent bias, and part of it is, who did they hire at Facebook? Did they hire liberals or did they hire conservatives? One of the things that's sort of a fact of a lot of education is that people with more education are often more liberal, and people with a little bit of it, little education are often more conservative. So you've got these highly educated college guys at Facebook, there's a possibility that they have a certain bias. So all that was fascinating to me, and if it's interesting to you, you've got kind of a trail there. And then this is one that just came in today, and it's the idea that there's a group, and it's called the Unicode Consortium, and they're the ones who decide the, the code so that if you're on a Unix machine and the letter capital F looks this way and you're on a Windows machine, you can get it to look the same way and you're on a Mac machine and it can look the same way. So basically, they standardized the code. Well, they have to standardize the codes for emojis and there used to be only a couple. There was a happy face, etc. And then people said, we need more emojis. Well now, they're apparently overburdened with the demand for more and more emojis, and they're saying it's never going to stop. Well, you know, we'll never have an end to the emojis. And so that's, this is a Chronicle of Higher Education article that I found pretty interesting. And so uh, I think that's kind of entertaining. All right. So then we've got this little video announcement I made the other day. And uh, response to your responses to the Survey of Theories of Visual Communication table on front page. So, you read that survey, and several of you said these are most relevant and those are least relevant. And it turns out that visual literacy was the most relevant by four people, but actually it was least relevant by one person. I can't remember, was it Adam or Stephen? I think it's Adam. And I think what's going on is the video that we saw about visual literacy was from the point of view of a uh, head of an art museum. And he's talking a lot about you need to be able to see this and see this and see this. But a lot of the focus was, and visual literacy ought to be taught in school just like verbal literacy is because it's important for people to have it. And so you might have been taking that part of his message, which was kind of an argument rather than explanation, and saying, oh, well, that's about school stuff. We, we, business doesn't need that, etc. So to some degree, you're sort of being on the outs with most people's understanding that no, visual literacy is very important because if you cannot make message, visual messages that people can understand, or if you cannot understand visual messages that other people make, you got a real problem of possible uh, communication failure between a business and its clients, its customers, its, uh, its employees, et cetera. So that was highly uh, valued. 
Uh, communication, mass communication, a couple people said was important. Signs and symbols, a couple people said was important. Only one person with cognition and information processing. Ideation, one person said was important, and two people said not important. And so I think some of the reading that we're going to talk about today that you did from this book, which is Barry's Visual Intelligence, when you start to understand ideation as sort of like the vision statement of a corporation, or your vision as like, this is how I'm going to see myself coming in first in a race, etc. Start to understand ideation in those regards, um, it has greater potential, business potential. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, visual versus verbal, two people said least relevant. And um, I think it's going to turn out that it's going to be a little bit more relevant because in terms, when we get the symbols and signs that we're going to just jump into at the end of class today, symbols and signs is really important. Well, guess what? Visual and verbal are both made out of symbols and signs. One of the things that the author or that the speaker in the visual literacy uh, video pointed out, he's got a picture of a stop sign. And he said, words are symbols. They are signs. You see the words, OK? So if you had your eyes closed and you're just listening to me, you'd just be hearing words. But whenever you read words, they become visual. They become visual information. Um, and then psychology, perception, physiology, sort of not. But then social sciences, one person said social sciences. And then it was Donna who lumped all the social sciences together and said none of them were of any value whatsoever. So that's how you know, we got all these over there. But interestingly, nobody mentioned art and aesthetics. Oh, yeah. And yet, when we talk about visual literacy, particularly the examples given to us by someone at an art museum, it's quite possible that art and aesthetics are really important. And when you think about the sample picture that Donna worked on, it was the picture of, it was an ad for the Fontainebleau Hotel, and it was the picture of a woman, and she had these sunglasses on, and the woman was probably by just about anybody's criteria, beautiful. Mm -hmm. The picture was beautiful. If they're trying to sell the Fontainebleau Hotel, they're probably not going to put an unattractive woman in a bad photograph up there and find it to go to the place, etc. So art and aesthetics are probably very important, yet nobody put them, nobody chose them, but since many people chose visual literacy, I think to some degree that visual literacy, the art and aesthetics were sort of in, in, uh, contained in that category. All right, so any questions about that? All right, so what I did was I, I marked up your responses that you wrote, I gave you a numerical score, and then I commented on it. Uh, okay, and now let's give you back the quizzes. The quizzes uh, you took last time, and so basically, I think I've got them up here. Um, the average score on the quizzes was 7.25, so some people got um, tens and some people got fives, and so nobody should sweat about it because um, you're going to get to drop the lowest score if you didn't do well on this one. And so, not to worry. And we'll, first I'll hand them back. So, Jamie is still not here yet. Donna. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Katie. Oh, Adam. And Rebecca. All right, so the quiz. Uh, the first one, the answer was, um, it's true. So one of the things is the behaviorists, old school psychologists, they had this notion, it just comes in your eyes and you're just responding to it as a stimulus. And so they were dominant in the 40s and 50s. They really did not know how complex was the thing going on in your brain to make an image. Um, yes, you can build a devil's triangle that works from one perspective, but not from any other perspective, so that's true. Uh, which of these do we construct all of them? Um, the phenomenal sense is the way things look to you. Phenomena, that comes from a Greek word, phenomai, and just means uh, sort of experience. Um, the relationship between what you see phenomenally and what you see relationally is, according to the authors, it's like icons and software on your computer. So basically, you got a little icon for a W for word. You click on that, so that's what you see. But then this relationship you have with it is this word program, which is this other richer thing. Vision is a genius we share with many other animals. That's true. Just the other day, I was watching some PBS show, and it was about owls. And the way owls see is just remarkable. And the way any birds of prey see. 
we have a refresh rate that's about 24 frames per second. So when we make movies or video, if it comes back 24 times in a second, it will look continuous to us. A hawk or an eagle has a refresh rate like in the hundreds of times per second. So what that means is when they're looking down and seeing a mouse, to them, it looks like it would look to us in slow motion. That's how they're able to kind of zoom in and get this mouse because they have this incredibly faster refresh rate in their, uh, their you know, visual cortex. Um, the authors state that uh, the thing that's amazing is that there are countless possible interpretations. So the thing that's on the back of your eye, that flat thing, could be interpreted any number of ways. And, and the amazing thing is that we soon learn how to interpret it so we know that that's the back wall, that's the side wall, that Deidre is here in front of Katie. We learn that, okay? And how do we learn it? Because each of us is equipped with a set of innate rules for interpretation that as a human, if you have normal vision and a normal brain, you are born with some rules for interpretation. It takes a while to get them going, you know? A, a baby just sees blobs of light, and eventually they can recognize faces, and then eventually they get distance. It takes a while to get it, but the while that they're getting it is because they have innate a whole collection of rules, and they're sort of applying those rules and making sense of it. And then the person who claimed uh, that the fundamental problem is uh, Noam Chomsky, and he's a linguist from MIT. He's also uh, a very uh, outspoken anti-war uh, person during the Vietnam War, and he's been a very outspoken sort of opponent of, of many government positions since then. And then the, fact, the final question, the ripple, the magic square, and the devil's triangle all demonstrate what about our visual intelligence? And it's, it's genius to construct. We have this genius to construct, which is what makes the devil's triangle and the magic square and the ripple turn into those things for us because we are busy constructing them. All right? Okay. All right. So don't fret if you didn't do well on it. We can dump the lowest quiz score and you'll have several more types. Okay. Um, I want to talk briefly now about modes of discourse or text types. First, let's look at the rest of the agenda for today. All right, so we did the links, we did the responses to the quiz, we did the quiz, most of this, of course, are text types. Then we're going to talk about your responses to the Barry chapter, so you're to answer one of four questions. I looked early and it seemed like some people were answering it. I think I saw three answers to question number one. So that almost never works out. I say there's four questions, I want two answers for each one. And what happens is somebody will be the third person, so something doesn't get two answers, but no problem, we'll figure it out. And, and one of the things that can happen is two people are writing it simultaneously. They say, oh, I see there's only one answer to question number one. And then two people are going to do question number one. So uh, we can figure that out. Coverage of content skipped from Barry chapter. So as I said in the assignment, this was a long chapter. It was a dense chapter. And I had you read only nine pages out of about 35. Mm -hmm. There's some interesting and valuable stuff in there. And so I'm going to kind of deliver that to you without having asked you to read it. And some of it is somewhat controversial. Basically, she makes a couple of statements about uh, people that are on the autism spectrum, OK? And the first one wasn't too bad, but the second one was you know, would be probably downright insulting to people who have autism or are autistic. And so I wanted to kind of um, straighten that stuff out. And then the other thing has to do with, she makes reference to chaos theory. And chaos theory is a fascinating theory that's been very popular we're trying to understand all kinds of things in the sciences, particularly the natural sciences. And so I've got a little bit about chaos theory in there. And then we're going to go an introduction to the theory of form. So last week, we did color theory. And this week, we're going to do the theory of form, which is more about the shapes. And I'm going to do it using this book, which turns out uh, a PDF that has most of the pictures in this book is online. And so I will click through them and then tell you what was in the book if you happen to have your own copy of the book. And then we're going to do another visual analysis exercise. So once again, you'll take something from your packet. And this time, I think I'll have your work in pairs. Hopefully, Jamie will be here by that time, because then we'll have four pairs of two. Um, and this time, um, I'll have you try and apply the theory of form to your picture. So you're going to look at what's being explained in this book how pictures work, 
and then try and look at a sample ad and say the forms are causing this uh, visual experience for you. Um, and then we will get into an introduction to semiotics. So back to the visual versus verbal. Semiotics is coming out of linguistics, but it's the study of symbols and signs. So several of you said symbols and signs are really important, and they are, but our understanding of them comes from the people who understand and analyze language, written language, spoken language, verbal language. And then uh, lead you into the readings for meeting number four. All right? So, let's go to modes of discourse, text types. All right, so, modes of discourse is something that was uh, very common, it was a common approach to communication, particularly teaching people to write. And the claim was that there's only four modes of discourse. There's description, narration, exposition, and argument. And this popular approach fell out of favor for a couple reasons. One of which said, okay, I've been teaching my students the four modes, and I have them write descriptions, I've had them write narrations, have them write expositions, have them write arguments. That's not helping at all. They're still not able to be good writers. They're not producing the kind of writing a lot. And the other complaint was there are almost no pure forms of one or the other. That everything is kind of part description and part narration, etc. And so it fell out of favor, but uh, some people, okay, Seymour Chapman is He's a narratologist. He's a, he's a linguist who specializes in narrative, basically how stories get told. He's got a book called Story and Discourse, and he spent a lot of his uh, scholarship on, here's a novel that got turned into a movie. How did they do that? What did they do? And so the whole idea that storytelling is an important and powerful way of communication uh, is central to what uh, he has to offer. So if you think of description, I could describe this bag here, this bag, and I can tell you its color is largely black, some gray. Um, its shape is rectangular. Um, it's uh, sort of soft. It's it's com somewhat soft. It's got a it's got a strap. Um, the feel is sort of canvas, etc. Doesn't smell. I haven't spilled anything in it. <laughs> and so the whole idea that description appeals to your senses. So when I describe something, a car or a person, or a song. I'm going to tell you what it looks like, or sounds like, or feels like. And so if all I'm doing is giving verbal characteristics that you can understand because you know how to hear, or see, or touch, or taste, or feel, then that's what description is going to be about. And so you're not going to find too many things that are purely descriptive, but you'll find things that are heavily descriptive. If you went to um, the travel section, of a newspaper, and they're telling me, you have to go to the Amalfi Coast because, and they'll start describing the sunlight, and the, the blue sea, and the taste of the food, etc., etc. So some modes of communication are very long on description. When you think about uh, fashion reporting, okay? Fashion, whether they're people describing what someone is wearing on the runway, or whether you're looking in a magazine, it's often going to talk about the color, and the feel, and the richness, and the fine detail, etc. So there's a lot of description. Narration, the, the salient feature of narration is that basically what you get is event, event, event over time. So when you tell the story of the three bears, or you tell the story of the three little pigs, first this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens. A lot of narrations are not necessarily told in chronological order. Some stories start now, and then, oh, guess what? You need to realize what happened back then. Oh, and guess what? You need to realize what happened back then. And so some of the, the greatest works of fiction don't just start now and go forward. A lot of times they start now, and in order for you to go forward, you need to know what happened back then. And some artists are particularly good at jumping around uh, with time. Has anybody ever read a short story by William Faulkner called A Rose for Emily? Mm -hmm. Okay, what do you think of A Rose for Emily, Adam? Kind of dark. Okay, kind of dark. It's often called a gothic tale. It's about a woman 
and a man, and the man done her wrong, and the woman kind of gets even. And so it's and set in a town, a southern town, etc. But the, the story starts now, and then jumps back, and then jumps forward, and then jumps back. And I think it has something like 37 time jumps in a story that's about 12 pages long. And yet, as you read it, you can follow it. But if you're not paying attention, you kind of don't even notice that it's jumping around. And yet, he takes you on this tale of, here we have today, but then there was this time, and then it went there, and then there was this time, etc. So it's an amazing piece of narration because of Faulkner's ability to control the narrative. Okay. Exposition is when you take something that's complicated and you make it understandable. So many of your textbooks are largely expository. You're reading a biology textbook and it's telling you about the Krebs cycle, okay? And it says, okay, first this thing happens, and then this thing happens, and then this thing happens, and then this thing happens, and you've got these chemical breakdowns in nature and the soil and the nutrients for plants, etc. And what it is, is it's taking something that's pretty complex, breaking it into a bunch of parts, and telling you what those parts are. Mm -hmm. And so most textbooks are largely expository. And so in an exposition, there's not really necessarily a thesis because there's not really any argument. I'm not arguing that the Krebs cycle is good or bad or indifferent. I'm telling you how it works. If you get a VCR, okay, and your VCR is blinking 12, 12, 12, and you want to know how to stop it from blinking 12, 12, 12, and you follow the instructions on how to stop it from blinking 12, 12, 12, basically, that's pure exposition. It's not saying you should stop it. I mean, you know you don't want it to go blink 12, 12, 12, 12, but how do you set the clock on the VCR? Well, the step-by-step -step instructions, that's pure exposition. But then we come to argument. Argument is you support a claim with reasons and evidence. So if we think about that video of visual literacy by the director of an art museum, a lot of it was exposition. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was, let me explain where the term come from. Let me explain what it means. Let me explain how if you had good visual literacy, you could see these features of this painting, the dream of an architect. Or you could see those features. And so I'm explaining what's the difference between shapes and line and form and color and accent and emphasis and movement. So he's explaining all that. But at the same time, part of that video was an argument. We should teach visual literacy. It's really important. So because it was kind of a mixed form, it was both explaining what it is and then saying, and it's really important and we've got to make sure the kids have it for a variety of reasons. It was one of these things that causes some people to wonder about the value of the modes of discourse. Okay? All right. And then when we think about ads, most of the ads that you look at, most of the ads that are in your packet are actually arguments. They're an argument, you should buy this because it's a great thing. You should get these furniture because it's beautiful. You, could, you should travel to the fountain blue because it's wonderful. You should buy these cosmetics because they're going to make you beautiful. So most advertisements are, in effect, um, a form of um, argument. This one here, I think, too. Now when you visit participating Starbucks stores, you can enjoy digital access to select articles from the New York Times with our compliments. So the idea is you should come into Starbucks not just for a cup of coffee, but guess what? Free access mm -hmm. to the New York Times. What a deal, okay? So it's an argument trying to get you to participate mm -hmm. in that. All right, so there were two things that were in the longer version of the chapter, The Nature and Power of Images, and one was about chaos theory. And chaos theory says small differences in initial conditions yield widely divergent outcomes for such dynamical systems, rendering long-term prediction impossible. So for a long time, people say, OK, we can predict the weather for tomorrow and you know, go out two days. But once you get to the five-day report, you're not really going to trust what's happening in five days. And it's because it's such a complex system. So it's really difficult to predict the weather for five days. But now, with better models and more satellite tracking, now they're giving you a 10-day uh, weather forecast. Again, you know, around day five, it starts to get unreliable. But if you look at this uh, animation here, and I think, do I have? Yeah, I've got the pendulum source. And we'll talk a little bit about image sourcing. Um, so you've got this pendulum. If, if it was a simple pendulum, you could track what it was doing 
and if there was no friction, you could know exactly what was happening and how it mo would move. But once it's a double pendulum, the thing starts this erratic movement, and it looks like it's completely chaotic. It looks like there's no order to it whatsoever. But see? There's order, there's order, there's order, there's order, there's order. Oh, it's getting disordered. Oh, it's out of control, okay? And another example they'll often give is if you've got a faucet that's dripping. And if it's dripping at a regular rate, it goes drip, drip, drip. You could graph that on a piece of paper, and you've got one drip every second, right? Open it up a little bit faster, and it goes drip, 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 two drips a second. And then eventually you open it up, open it up, and it's just flowing out, and it's all chaotic. It's not just dripping, it's like, it's like bubbling. As it's coming out of the faucet, it's like bubbling, okay? And that's because it has gotten so chaotic, and you cannot see the order. But chaos theory says there is an order. It's just extremely complex, okay? And so the relevance of this, according to uh, Anne-Marie Seward Barry, some psychologists have hypothesized that the brain makes sense of visual stimuli in ways that are more consistent with the ordering of chaos theory than the ordering of linear systems. So the reason she brought it up was that um, it's really complex, and you do have a genius for construction, but it's possible that it's not chaos. It's just a little more complex than we are yet able to really sort of understand fully and map. So let's talk a little bit about this, this little thing I've got down at the bottom of the page. Pendulum image source, HTTPS comments, blah, 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 blah. In my video, I mentioned that among the samples of the visual autobiographies was one that I did. And what I had done is I'd taken a Word document and then I made it visual by putting pictures into it. I didn't use Word to put pictures into it. I used Pages, which is the Word processor that's native to Mac because it's much more picture friendly. But then at the bottom, what I did was I had sources and all those pictures that I had posted in there, I said, these are my sources for my video, right? I was helping Donna create her visual autobiography in PowerPoint, and she got a bunch of pictures. And I didn't tell her, oh, by the way, you want to get the source where you got the picture, copy that and put it down in the notes pages. But from here on, as you develop right. it, let's do that. Because I'll go back. there are, there's a thing called intellectual property. And these pictures that are out there, they belong to people. Mm -hmm. Now, again, back to section one, paragraph, section 110, paragraph one, in a not-for-profit, face-to-face teaching environment, you can perform or display anything you want without anybody's permission needed. But let's say you make something in this class and you would like to use it elsewhere. You're gonna post it on your blog. You're gonna publish it somewhere, etc. Well, now you're in the place of it's not face-to-face. -face, it's not teaching. Uh, it might not be not-for-profit. You might be getting paid you know, to give a presentation, etc. So one of the things you wanna do is you want to keep track of where all your images came from. By and large, for this class, you're gonna to get to use any image you want. But let's say you have a PowerPoint or a Prezi. Somewhere, keep a log of where the images came from so that you're saying, it's like, okay, I'm gonna give credit where credit's due. So I did not make this cool GIF of chaos theory. And so what I do is I put it down there. That's where I got it from. And we're gonna see a, a uh, PowerPoint a little later on. And what I tend to do in PowerPoint is I've got a picture that I borrowed and it's in the slide. I don't put the image source information right on the slide, which some, in some disciplines they say you should, okay? My discipline, they don't really say I have to. So what I do is I put it in the notes page. Because mm -hmm. then often if I'm at a conference and I present a PowerPoint, what I do is I say, okay, everybody can have access to the full PowerPoint. So you're gonna get the information about where I got the picture. Mm -hmm. And I just don't feel obligated to put it in the slide. If I were a chemist, and I was going to give a presence at the American Chemical Society. American Chemical Society says, you have a picture of a chemical compound on your slide, you better put where that picture came from. So different disciplines have different degrees of sort of persnicketiness when it comes to your sources. But what you want to do is always keep track of your sources and at some point be in a position to tell people where you got them from, but you don't have to worry about copyright because section 110, paragraph one, Classroom exemption, perform or display anything you want with no permission required from anybody. Okay? All right. That's all interesting that you said that because, you know, 
um, there's a lot of people that come in the museum and um, you know there's um we what happens is when you're looking at a painting or you're even even taking a picture of a painting you have to make sure that um, well we make sure we put put cameras next to the ones that you cannot take pictures right. of but people take pictures of them and um, they are told that you know because of the rights and different things because you know it yeah. belongs to someone else you're not supposed to you know, take those pictures and use them. Right. But I've seen, <laughs> we've looked in books and we've seen Absolutely. where people have gone and used these things yep. and did not even have the permission to do it, yep. you know. Yep. So, you know, I, um, I I talked to some of the people that are, you know, part of the museum uh, in that part of the, you know, in the part of that museum that deals with that. And I asked them, I said, well, what do you do when you see stuff like that? They don't do anything. Yeah. Well, it turns out copyright law is fairly complicated and it's different in the U.S. than it is in other countries. Mm -hmm. Things that are copyrighted, copyright expires. So some paintings that are made a long time ago, they copyright belong to the artist and then the copyright expired. Mm -hmm. um, then sometimes copyright gets refreshed. So some modern art, the copyright belongs to the artist. And let's say you buy a painting from a contemporary artist. This man or woman is still alive. You bought the painting. And now you own the painting. You paid $1,000 for it. Mm -hmm. You got it hanging on your house. That's your painting to have. Mm -hmm. Now you take a picture of the painting mm -hmm. and you put that in the book. And the artist could say, no, you don't have a right to pictures of the painting. You only have a right to the physical painting. That's what you bought. Mm -hmm. I have the right to pictures of it and I put them in art catalogs, etc. And you violated my copyright. So if it's a really old painting where the copyright has expired, it's not going to be an artist making that claim. Mm -hmm. But okay. many contemporary works of art the copyright for the image itself belongs to the artist until such time as he or she assigns it to someone else. Mm -hmm. The physical painting is yours, but the, bike, the right to copy it and reproduce it and put it on t-shirts, not so much. Wow. And so then museums are often filled with images, some of which there's no copyright held, some of which is there's copyright held by the museum, some of which the copyright is still held by the original artist, and the museum only owns the physical first one. Mm -hmm. Okay? <laughs> All right. Um, so that, that was one thing about chaos theory. Now, we've got a couple more, which has to do with autism spectrum and dual exceptionality. All right? So, here's three people, uh, Albert Einstein, Nikolai, Nikola Tesla, and Temple Grandin, all of whom could well have had uh, been placed somewhere on the autism spectrum, autism disorder spectrum. And so, it turns out Einstein was kind of very late talker. He was not very verbal as a young child. Einstein oh. failed some math uh, classes in school. Um, oh. And yet, he was an amazing Jeez. visionary. And one of the things that his, great, his breakthroughs are explained this way. He basically, he's looking and he's, he's seeing it in his head. He's seeing in his head somebody traveling in a spaceship and, and time is changing, etc. So he, who may have had verbal weaknesses and mathematical weaknesses had incredible vision weaknesses. Nikola Tesla was a guy who was a contemporary of Thomas Edison and he actually ended up being sort of an arch enemy of Thomas Edison. And he's the one who came up with the kind of current that we actually have, which is alternating current. Um, uh, Edison was a great believer in direct current, battery current, etc. And so uh, he was a, an amazingly brilliant genius who invented all kinds of things, but he could have had some other sort of disability. So he's got tremendous ability up here, disability down there. And Temple Grandin is a uh, sort of uh, environmentalist, animal rights person who is a prolific author and uh, basically has accomplished a lot despite the fact that she had some language processing difficulties. So this is uh, Barry saying, and, uh, of Grandin, an autistic who has successfully overcome most of the limitations associated with autism, Grandin believes that no one indicated that visual thinking is the primary method of processing information. It is the extreme ability of many autistics to solve jigsaw puzzles and memorize enormous amounts of information at a glance. All right? So, we're going to watch a little video. Has anybody seen this? Stephen Wiltshire? Mm -hmm. Stephen Wiltshire is called the human camera. So basically, he's a guy who has limited communication abilities. You might say he's you know, he's sort of he's disabled when it comes to communication. But he's got an amazing ability to draw things that he sees. Stephen Wiltshire from London is a star among savants. 
His nickname is The Living Cameron. Stephen is autistic. He lives in a world of his own. Communication is difficult for him. He didn't speak his first words, pencil and paper, until he was five. Yet when he was 11, he drew a perfect aerial view of London after only one helicopter ride. Even the number of windows in all the major buildings in his drawing was correct. For this film, we're testing the living camera in Rome. Stephen has never seen the Eternal City from above before. After only a 45-minute helicopter flight, we'll ask him to draw a five-and-a-half-yard panoramic picture of the historic city center without having a second glance at it. Stephen has three days. In these three days, Stephen will have to keep thousands of details in his head. The innumerable coppolas, the tiny winding streets, all the balconies and windows of the endless array of houses, and each and every column and window arch of Rome's major sites, from the Pantheon to St. Peter's to the Colosseum. Stephen has never trained for this feat of magic. The miracle simply happened when he first started to draw. Yet none of us would have bet that Stephen would be able to draw Rome just from memory. Five and a half yards of paper can look scarily empty. The amazing thing, Stephen starts the drawing as we would, with the Church of St. Peter's. But he doesn't do any sketches, nor roughing out of the space for the drawing. It's as if the panorama already existed within his head, with all the proportions, all the roads, all the details. A little miracle. At the end of the second day, Stephen is a good halfway through his creation. After three days of his drawing marathon, even Stephen Wiltshire starts to tire. He has filled in more than five yards of paper in fine pencil. He has been restlessly aligning window to window and house to house because Stephen loves to be applauded for his art. In the left corner, he's finally reached the ruins of the Forum Romanum. Stephen's sister Annette is rejoicing with him. He's made it. Obviously, he's pleased with his work. Yet our vexing question still remains. How precise was Stephen's ability to memorize? Is it really true that you could only see a single curve of the tiger from above? We started to compare the accuracy of the drawing with the real thing. Is Stephen's version of St. Peter's Cupola too dominant? Yet here again, like with the curve of the Tiber, Stephen is frighteningly right. <laughs> we wondered if the famous Roman hill should probably stand up more in Stephen's panorama. But again, Stephen had seen it better. From a thousand feet up, the hills are, optically, almost level. Checking the Pantheon, we did discover some minor inaccuracies on the roof. But the number of columns of the portal is, again, absolutely correct. Despite our doubts, Stephen has drawn one of the most complex buildings, the Colosseum, so precisely, it's practically a blueprint of reality. Stephen was also accurate in the instances we checked of nameless buildings and side streets. Had he had more time, his sister Annette believes, he would have put in even more detail. Some, some of the areas of all of that part, lots of detail, remember things that of the some of the cities and the neighborhoods and the villages. 
and um, the, um, the easy part is uh, St. Peter's and the um, Forum and the uh, Colosseum and um, memorize it by head and uh, confront by memory. Mm -hmm. So what do we think of that? Wish I had the talent. <laughs> I wish I knew my talent. So what, if anything, does it cause you to think about vision and how it works, no. or seeing and how it works? I have no idea. Yeah. But we have no idea how that works. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. really deep. I yeah. mean, it's really something that you really can't, to me, comprehend. And one of the things is we, who have normal verbal mm -hmm. skills and can read and write, can't do that. He has seemingly below normal verbal skills, maybe doesn't read, probably can't write, and he can do that. And so this notion of dual exceptionality, there are a lot of people who are really good at one thing and not so good at another thing. And one of the things that seems to show up among these people who are often called savants, um, they used to use the term idiot savant. And the term idiot actually means, it's like idiosyncratic, it's like you know, you and you alone are just like that, nobody's like that. So mm -hmm. it's not, it doesn't mean the same as that someone is retarded, mm -hmm. it means like, you know, uh, idiosyncratically uh, individual. And so uh, some of these idiot savants, um, they can't draw like that, but you say, what day of the week was August 15th, 1492? They say, oh, Wednesday, and they're right all the time. And then you say, you know, what's uh, 12,562 by 848? And they just tell you the answer because they can do it, they can calculate it immediately. So one of the things about vision and um, perception is that uh, there are people who have amazing powers um, that are um, sort of, we just, we can't make sense of it. On a related story, this is a story that was in the New York Times, uh, 2015, October 9th, and it's called Super Recognizers. And this is the story about a detective in London who has an incredible ability to recognize faces. And so what happens is, he's walking along, so he can look through the mug book that shows all the criminals in a certain area of London, right? And then he can be walking down the street, and he goes, that's one of them. He just, he has this amazing ability to facially recognize. And so, again, he has some other things that are not so, so, so his, his colleagues and the defect, detectives, what do they do? They make fun of him. They call him Yoda, you know? Mm. Plus, he and he alone has this ability and has this incredible success rate because of his ability mm. to recognize faces that can't be explained other than, you know, he, he's got it. Mm. He's got this skill that is rather unusual and rather, uh, it's rather exceptional and, and rather much, um, in advance of what is normally found. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so let's talk about your responses to the Barry chapter. So let's go to uh, assignments. And we've got responses to nature and power of images. And we've got, okay, the first question was, Primal Invariance, Cave Art to Comics. The author makes an argument that cave art, some children's art, and comic art may not be inferior to the art that depicts things more realistically. In fact, such art may be superior to mere likenesses of reality. Explain how or why that might be true. So I think we have maybe three people who answered that. So among some of the people who chose to answer number one, what have you got to say about what Barry said? <laughs> who answered number one? I did. You did? Okay. Donna, what do you have to say about it? Yeah, say that. <laughs> well, of course she was saying that there are there are unsophisticated women. Well, um, oh wow, I can't I could see I could look at my paper and tell you. Uh -huh. But uh, no, um she was really, you know, saying that um the um you know, if you look at the art really, if you look at the art of these different forms or whatever, um there you know, they're not crude, you know, they're not unsophisticatedly sophisticated crude and crude. <sighs> okay, I gotta go to my paper. Huh. <laughs> there it is. I, you, no, you, you, you can read from what you wrote. 
Well, and one of the reasons I have you, I use her right, examples because yeah, well, one of the reasons I have you write responses to these I things you is so you will have figured it out beforehand and then we can share them and so obviously you can't remember everything you wrote but right I just um I just said I'm just gonna only share a part because I know some, everybody else shared their own theirs but I just said that um the author was not thinking of the art as unsophisticated or crude Im crude images although the art was primitive only in the sense that it was basic primal because they were looking at it as basic I mean she was speaking about it as being um, basic primal and um, produced with um, various sorts of applications. I said the cave art to comics children, children's art and art may not have been inferior because today our environment is dominated by the visual. Various television and multimedia is creating the images which will process our perceptual thinking ability. And then I put the following are um, examples. Um, I used the one about the, and I thought that was really amazing. If you look at the presence of flutes that were made of bird bone near the paintings, it suggests that music may have been a part of the viewing experience. And the part that I really liked about the, there was another part where she talked about the cave and how, um, you know, you can experience the wording coming from these, these, you know, the, you know, experience sound, sound okay. coming from these, these different types. And I thought that that was um, unusual, okay. you know, or. So or, somebody right now today might have a farm right. and they're raising beef cattle and they might have a picture of a nice, you know, beef cattle out on their farm and that picture represents, you know, kind of a realistic portrait of one mm -hmm. of their beef cattle. And so these people making the cave art are engaged in something other than possibly mm -hmm. just, I want a realistic portrait of this bison or of this uh, leopard or mm -hmm. of this bird, etc. And so one of the claims is that these people, and this, these are going way back, these are you know 15,000 years ago, that uh, some of them, that art actually had a magical purpose. And so what happens is you draw one of these bison that you would be able, that you would like to be able to kill because you want to eat it, and then in your cave, you've got the spear, and you're actually sticking the spear point into the picture of the bison on the wall. Yeah. Why? Because tomorrow you're going hunting bison, <laughs> and you're engaged in sort of visualization. Mm -hmm. So it's not just representation. There's actually a magical dimension to it, is one of the theories. And they actually you know, can see evidence where, where there are jabs of stone points into the pictures, etc. So one of the claims is, you can't judge this, and if it's if it's got one too many legs, okay, that's because it's moving, mm -hmm. okay? So it's not a mistake, it's not bad drawing. Mm -hmm. It is artistic representation that might be doing something that our normal, straightforward, you know, photorealistic representation. Right. All right, somebody else who responded to, what, what do you got, Jojo? Um, I said that it was interactive and modern for its time. Okay. Considering like using the example of the bison, the fact that um, obviously at that time they didn't have motion picture. Okay. Mm -hmm. And for something that we have like now so readily, they had to figure out how to do that first because mm -hmm. there was no other illustrations before cave paintings. They were the first to do it. Okay. So um, by adding like the fifth leg, and suddenly that became a sort of language. Now when the next person drew a bison, it was able to put that fifth leg. It was just known. So it was a different type of. Um, learning style and perspective. And I also said that it added a, a different dimension. If you look at a realistic painting, yeah, if you, I guess you could paint realistically a cow running, but you might not catch the level of um, like fierceness that it has or like, um, like sound and stuff. And like she was mentioning, it was way more interactive in a realistic painting. Now you might see a cow grazing on some grass, but like you're not gonna get like the feeling of it, you're gonna say, oh yeah, I've like seen that before. Okay. Um, so I said so that it added another dimension and it was very modern for its time. Yeah, and one of the things that happens when we get to modern art, we get to the uh, beginning of the 20th century and you have cubists and stuff like that, they say, okay, here's a picture of a woman, what you would see for, if you saw her from the front. But guess what, if you were there, near her, you could see her from the side too. So the picture includes the front view and the side view attached to it and the back view. Yeah. And so in modern art, they start doing stuff and it's almost, when do they start doing that? They start doing that when the camera's invented. So it used to be, if we want a good portrait of you, I gotta hire a really good portrait artist who's gonna paint a really good portrait of you and it's from this perspective. 
then along comes the camera, and any joker can take a picture of you and you and you, and what's the value then of painting? Well, then painting has to do something else, and one of the things it does is it shows you from the front and from the side and from the back, all in one painting, and we get cubism. Mm -hmm. Well, to some degree, 15,000 years ago, cave painters may have been doing some stuff that art painters only got back around to after sort of a 15,000 year delay. Who else? Anybody else respond to number one? I think there were three responses. Anybody? No? All right. How about number, question number two says, Barry dedicates a section of image affordances and defines affordance differently from a more generic definition. See the definitions, blah, blah, blah. Explain, explain if you can, the point that Barry is making about crude versus essential when it comes to cave paintings and children's drawings. Did anybody tackle that question? Number two? Might be that nobody did it. <laughs> All right, we can skip that. We'll come back to affordances later. In the section on mental imagery, Barry makes claims about the importance of a unified corporate vision and draws comparisons to the visualization techniques of professional athletes, the impact of mental imagery on physical states in the field of medicine, as well as the visualization practices of Native American tribes. Evaluate the section of Barry's argument about the power of images. Do you find it convincing and are relevant to the study of visual communication for business purposes? Mm -hmm. So who took on question number three? Deandra, what'd you say? Um, I said I agreed with it. I think that, um, and I also talked about the one example with like medicine, how like in the cancer patients, they tell them, you know, to like visualize like, um, like the cancer being treated and that like the, med like the visualize the medicine working so it gets them thinking positively and so it's like increased their survival rate. So um, I, but yeah, I agree with that visualization because it does, you know, and you want your employees to be um, like unified so if they know what the common goal is and you're positively like reinforcing what you want them to achieve in the business, your employees will like work well together and they will like achieve those goals. Okay. Stephen, did you also answer that one? Yeah. So I, I thought it was relevant, and I compared it to a sports team when uh, saying how it's important for business purposes. Because sports team, it's a business. You're, set, you're selling product, you're selling merchandise, and product to the team. So you have the, the coaches, pretty much the managers, the players, the employees. You have to keep them motivated, keep them striving towards a vision, a vision of winning a championship and you reach that through hard work and uh, selflessness. And then you also have to have a vision that reaches the fans so that they keep buying merchandise, keep coming to the games. Okay. That basically gives them hope that the team will reach that vision. Okay, great. Rebecca? I totally subscribe to this idea of like positive visualization. Okay. And besides the fact that like academics write about it, it's an Oprah thing. So yeah. I know it's got to be <laughs> okay, there you go. Um, um, yeah. like the, the psychologists may know something, yeah, but, but Oprah, Oprah like, man, she's, she's got like, she said she's, she's got, got everything. And like I see it as like why not do it as opposed to like <laughs> think negatively. And as in terms of business, I look at it from the uh, when you explain something, the, the vision statement helps the customer as well because it. Uh, it tells the customer what their expectations of the business are so that you'll have positive like customer satisfaction because if they don't know exactly what good or service you provide, they might have higher expectations than you even provide. So they know their role and then like the business people know their role and the employees know their role as well. Okay. All right. And so then again, in terms of what people thought were useful parts from the original survey. People said, oh, ideation not happening, but if you think of what is ideation and what is a vision statement, the two could be actually very closely related. Let me see, I think I have a page, and I'm not sure where is it, if it's in uh, um, Tools and Resources. Ah, here we go. So, exactly what constitutes a vision statement is open to some debate. Wikipedia defines it as follows. A vision statement is a company's roadmap indicating both what the company wants to become and guiding transformational initiatives by setting a defined direction for the company's growth. Okay? And then the Wikipedia article goes on and differentiates a mission statement from a vision statement. Mission statements and vision statements fill different purposes. A mission statement describes an organization's purpose and answers the questions, what business are we in? And what is our business for? 
A vision statement provides strategic direction and describes what the owner or founder wants the company to achieve in the future. Okay? But if you go on the Facebook page for Amazon, it describes its mission with the following vision statement. Mm. Amazon says, mission, our vision is to be the Earth's most customer-centric company to build a place where people can come to find and discover anything they might want to buy online. Okay? So if you think a vision statement should help members of the organization see things that might otherwise be rather abstract. It should help a wide variety of stakeholders, quote, be on the same page, if you will. Below is a link to the leadership principles that Amazonians are supposed to use every day. Do they help you see what a leader at Amazon looks like? So here then are the Amazon leadership principles. And I can make them a little bigger. So basically, a leader at Amazon, leaders start with the customer and work backwards. Leaders are owners. Leaders expect and require innovation and invention from their teams and always find ways to simplify. Leaders are right a lot. Leaders are never done learning and always seek to improve themselves. Leaders raise the performance bar with every hire and promotion. Leaders have relentlessly high standards. Thinking small is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Leaders create and communicate a bold direction. Speed matters in business. Many decisions and actions are reversible and do not need extensive study. Accomplish more with less. Leaders listen attentively. Leaders operate at all levels. Leaders are obligated to respectfully challenge decisions when they disagree. Leaders focus on the key inputs. So, are these vision statements? If you were to read them, do you think you would have a better sense of what is a leader at Amazon? Do they help you see how leadership works at Amazon? Yeah? A little bit. So, Again, we're back to that it's ideation. You're taking these abstract things mm -hmm. and you're turning them into mm -hmm. things that are less abstract, maybe more visible, more maybe more concrete. And so um, that's one of the ways where vision, if we think of vision as merely light rays coming into our eyeballs, we're using a notion of vision which can be expanded quite a bit. And certainly in the business world and in athletics, and in other places, there are people who have expanded it quite a bit. And it's not about actual light rays bouncing into your eyeballs. It's about mental pictures and images. And when you consider that when light rays do, do come into our eyeballs, we're making a picture in our brain. The distinction then between an actual picture that's coming into my eyeballs at that door and the picture of me goes, oh, I see myself as being successful as a professor and getting promoted, etc. The two are not totally opposite things. They have some connections, and I think Oprah is right. There's a lot, and I think it was, it might be Norman Vincent Peale might have been somebody who was sort of the uh, father of uh, philosophy of you know uh, positive thinking. You think positively, and guess what? You can have a positive life. And look, the opposite can be true. You think negatively, and you see everything as an obstacle, and guess what? Basically, you're just gonna have obstacles that you're running through over and over again. Okay. All right, so we're now going to jump into an introduction to the theory of form. All right, so let's see if that's next. Um, nope, oh, that's, I need to go back to modules. So that page that was there, that was in uh, resources, I think. Um, introduction to theory of form by Molly Bangs, picture this. All right, so Molly Bang wrote this book in 1991. Picture this, how pictures work. Rudolf Arnheim is one of the most influential authors about art and visual perception. He wrote Art and Visual Perception, a Psychology of the Creative Eye. Bang described him as the Dean of Psychology of Art in the United States. And Arnheim said, Bang succeeding in using geometrical shapes, not as geometry, but entirely as dynamic expression. So she's going to go through this book about Little Red Riding Hood and using mostly just shapes and composition, she's going to get you, she's going to try and get you to feel things about this story. So I've got two sort. I have a physical book here. This is a link to a PDF which is online. This is a link to that PDF downloaded here. And so I'll open, it, open up this one. And so this is something that somebody who is teaching a class at a school put up online. And certainly there are questions about um, should it have been put up? Possibly not. 
uh, Molly Mine is sort of being denied access to the money to buy the book, but since it's up here, uh, I'm going to share it with you. All right, so let me. Uh, All right, so she wants to tell the story of Little Red Riding Hood, and she starts with that first shape, and she says, do you feel anything about this shape? And let's say that's Little Red Riding Hood, and she wants to include Little Red Riding Hood's mother, because Little Red Riding Hood's mother is in the story. So now there's Little Red Riding Hood and her mom, okay? But she's got a problem with this, because the story is about Little Red Riding Hood, and now mom, is more important, okay? So what can she do? What she does is she makes mom sort of not so hard edged. Mom, make her a little huggable. So take the big triangle, and instead of having the, the sharp points that Little Red Riding Hood has, now mom's a little softer. <laughs> mom is still too big, okay? Okay? So what does she do? She makes her kind of a soft purple color. So now, because red being so vibrant, Little Red Riding Hood is now really important still compared to mom, even though mom is much bigger. Mm -hmm. Mom is bigger and softer, but that muted tone, but again, if she made it green, then there's no relationship between the two of them. Mm -hmm. Purple is made from red and blue, mm -hmm. so this is a relationship. This is a large, soft relation relative mm -hmm. of Little Red Riding Hood, but in this story now, Little Red Riding Hood is still more important. Mm. Okay, and now this is the basket. The basket that Little Red Riding Hood is gonna take to go and take to uh, her grandmother, right? And now, she has to go through the woods. And so, what she's trying to do is she's trying to use the simplest shapes possible to have Little Red Riding Hood go through. But she's got a problem with these ones in that they're sort of they're not threatening enough. Mm. So now, she does, and she makes this be the woods, but now the problem is that they're kind of the same shape as Little Red Riding Hood. Mm -hmm. So she's saying, all right, I already used that shape for Little Red Riding Hood. These things are kind of threatening, but they're, they're kind of like Little Red Riding Hood. So what do I do? I make this be the woods. Mm. Now the woods is just made out of the trunks of the trees. Totally different shape. You're not going to confuse it with Little Red Riding Hood. And it's, it's sort of ominous, okay? And now, here's Little Red Riding Hood in the woods, but it's not really all that scary. Why? Little Red Riding Hood isn't that little. <laughs> now, the woods are scarier because there's a greater size difference wow. between her and the woods that she's in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now it's even scarier yet. Now the woods are terrifying. Because Little Red Riding Hood is really little. Mm -hmm. And those woods are really big. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so again, these woods, all they are is black vertical lines. Mm -hmm. But by making some of them smaller and farther back, she has created three dimensions. She's used form, just simple geometric shapes, to create three dimensions and to give you this sense that Little Red Riding Hood is pretty terrifying, or pretty small, okay? And now, by putting her further up in the picture, she's in a more positive space. It's not as scary. But oh. by having the woods possibly fallen over on her, <laughs> we're back to being, this is scary. It's unstable. There's some, there's some dynamic stuff going on, and it's not necessarily positive dynamic stuff. And now we got a scary, it's, it's just triangles. She was a triangle, mom was a triangle, these are just more triangles, but these triangles are kind of scary. And can we make them scarier? Okay. Maybe when it's smaller, it's not as scary. Maybe this is a scarier version. I mean, it's smaller, it's not so scary. And then it's not so scary when the wolf has kind of a blunt nose. Hey, he looks kind of like a dog. He's not so scary. And then what about this? He's probably not as scary when he's a pale color. And also that was the color of my mom. Alright? 
Uh, now we made the wolf a lot scarier. It's just triangles, but clearly we're reading the triangles as teeth. And now he's scarier still because he's got teeth and an eye. And he can use his eye to see little red riding hood. And then we make the eye red, and now it's scarier yet. Because mm -hmm. one, you've got this, this red eye, he's kind of evil, he's hungry. And then we make the eye a triangle. It's not so scary because basically his eye and Little Red Riding Hood are kind of the same thing. He's now sort of connected to Little Red Riding Hood in a way. It's like, no, oh, I'm not going to eat you. I'm going to be your friend. I'll be your pet. And so we're back to the scarier eye. And then <laughs> throwing a big red tongue, it's even scarier still. Right? And then now it's nighttime. So by making the background purple, now again, that's the purple that was kind of the color of mom. We had a positive relationship, but that was a while ago. So now suddenly Little Red Riding Hood is in the scary woods in the nighttime with this big scary wolf. And now make the teeth white and it's scarier still. And so now we're going to go through and talk about some principles. So the, the first part of the book is the story. And then she's got some principles laid in here. And so these are basic principles that Rudolf Arnheim is going to say, this is how pictures work. This is the psychology of pictures. And so if you can kind of absorb these or remember these, and you have access to this file, so you're going to be able to get back to them. And then try and think of when you do or do not see these formal elements in a graphic, you'll start to be working with sort of the psychology of pictures as developed by Rudolf Arnheim probably close to uh, three quarters of a century ago and pretty much subscribed to by a wide variety of people and say these are some features of images that have power. So the first one says is smooth flat horizontal shape give us a sense of stability and calm. So that's a nice calm picture. So if you've got a picture in an ad and you want it to be calm you want people to think if you come to this spa, you'll be calm. Nice, big, broad, flat, horizontal at the bottom. Vertical shapes are more exciting and more active. So if you want to have a picture of a disco, you're going to try and get people to come to this place where it's going to be exciting, then the big, flat, horizontal is not the way to go, but some verticals might do it for you. And if you put a horizontal bar at the top, you're back to stability. So. Vertical shapes are exciting and active, but you stabilize them by adding this thing across the top. And if you make them diagonal, you've got motion and tension. One of the things I noticed from a couple of people last time who were pointing to their pictures, which were architectural pictures, mm -hmm. there was a whole many examples of that um, gestalt feature of continuation, basically. This causes our eyes to follow. It's hard to say in this one whether it's going to make our eyes follow up and out that way or down and in this way. But what diagonals do is they get us to, to follow the motion. All right. Diagonal shapes are dynamic. Diagonals in picture often tie a vertical and a horizontal together as a much more stable unit. So it turns out the triangle is an incredibly stable architectural feature. And now, this thing has a whole lot of stability in it that would not have been there if that diagonal were not holding the, the vertical and the horizontal together. These diagonal buttresses are under great tension. That one, I'm not, I'm not feeling that one quite so much as the others. Mountains, slides, waves, all these are diagonals in movement or in tension. Triangle placed on a flat base gives a feeling of stability. So originally a little red riding hood and her mom, real stable. You put the flat end down, but as soon as you take that thing and put it on its edge, we've got movement and instability. So you got a picture of an interior and you want people to feel safe and comfortable and happy. You can have any triangles have 
flat on the bottom. And if you've got something where you're trying to communicate excitement or tension or maybe danger, then a triangle pointed that way is going to be a much different feel. It's going to it's going to evoke a different feel among the viewers. What increases the sense of movement even more in this picture? So one, you've got triangles, and the triangles are not on their flat end, so they're unstable, and that Gestalt uh, principle of continuation, basically we're probably gonna, these are rockets going off to go blow up some enemy territory, and we're gonna follow the trajectory of those things going out there. All right. The upper half of the picture is a place of freedom, happiness, and triumph. Objects placed in the top half often feel more spiritual. So one of the pictures, Little Red Riding Hood, when she was down here, it was kind of scary. And you put her up in the top third, and now it's not so scary.